All right, thank you for joining us for this presentation, Adaptations Evolving in a Changing World. I'm Beverly Rayner, Director and Curator at Cabrillo Gallery. With me is my colleague, Victoria May. Say hello, Victoria. Hello. Who is the Art Gallery Coordinator. And I'd like to quickly introduce our presenters and each of you please say hello. So unmute yourselves, say hello so people can see your faces um, after I say your name. First in line is me. Hi. <laughs> Second is Jane Gregorius. Hi, thanks for coming. Next up is Tobin Keller. Hey, people. Leslie Loudon. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Neely Drown. Hello. And Claire Thorson. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. So every year the Cabrillo Gallery presents an art faculty exhibition. Sometimes it's a sabbatical show. Sometimes it's an exhibition that honors recent retirees, but most often it's a group show of all faculty and staff. This year's faculty and staff exhibition is titled Adaptations. Let's start the um, screen share now, Vic. Slideshow. So there are over 30 artists in this exhibition. There are all uh, staff or current or retired instructors in the art photography. Oops, hang on a second. I just got thrown off a bit by going full screen. Okay, <clears throat> backing up. Okay, art photography and art history programs at Cabrillo College. Their work covers a wide range of media, disciplines and subjects, just like our art program does. This exhibition gives our educators and support staff a chance to share insights into their artistic practice with the Cabrillo students they mentor and the community at large. <clears throat> Artists, as creative people, are natural problem solvers. We constantly find novel solutions to challenges that come up as we conceptualize and materialize our artwork. The artists in this exhibition, who are also educators, have had an extra complicated array of problems to solve since the pandemic hit. They had to adapt to teaching art online at the start of 2020, and now most of them are finding ways to adapt to returning safely to the classroom to teach in person again this semester. So they are definitely well practiced in the art of making adaptations <clears throat> and coping with the ever changing circumstances we've all been faced with these days. Okay, next slide, Vic. If you would like to see the adaptations exhibition, the exhibition is online only. Victoria has put the links into the chat where we'll be doing that soon if she hasn't already. The links to our online image gallery for the exhibition and to our Instagram and Facebook. I also wanted to let you know what's coming up at the gallery the rest of the semester. Our next exhibition is Moving Images, Pause, Restart. It's a juried exhibition of video shorts. The juror is Clark Buckner, director, director of Telematic Gallery and Media Arts Production in San Francisco. Our final exhibition this semester is our ever popular 12 by 12 Open Invitational. And uh, anybody who wants to can be in this show. We are hoping to have it in person in the gallery this year. We have our fingers crossed that forces beyond our control won't prevent that from happening again like it did last year. If you want to keep up with all of our programming, but you're not receiving our email newsletters, there's a form on our website homepage where you can subscribe to get all the latest updates on our exhibitions and talks. Next slide, Vic. Today's talk is titled Adaptations, Evolving in a Changing World. This is the second of three artist talks for the Adaptations exhibition. In this talk, six artists will talk about their work in the exhibition that reflects a variety of reactions to how the pandemic has affected our lives and the ways we have tried to adapt to it. Next slide. And the first artist is me, Beverly Rayner. Uh, in addition to my role as director of Cabrillo Gallery, I teach gallery and museum viewing and alternative process photography at Cabrillo. I have a BFA in sculpture and an MFA in photography from San Jose State University, and I've been at Cabrillo since 2014. 
So before I start my presentation, I just want to start out by saying that um, this will be a dark little journey back into a difficult time. Uh, it focuses on the hard parts, some of which linger on into the present. But I want to assure you that even though what you're about to see is dark, I'm not a person who gets stuck in darkness. My attitude in life is generally positive and my default setting is actually happy. So don't worry about my state of mind, I'm okay, really. Um, sometimes my art is just a way of coping with the difficult stuff that life throws at me. Next slide. <clears throat> Invisible, it crept in. Everything put on hold. Fear of the unknown, spinning in uncertainty, surging with cortisol. And so the long days and nights of anxiety set in. Invisible, it made the outside world feel toxic. All surfaces suspect. Carriers of the invisible, carriers of uncertainty, carriers of anxiety. We have to disinfect the groceries. Next slide. Next slide, Vic. My own hands became suspect, carriers of the invisible, carriers of anxiety, carriers of the uncertain, attached to my body, but not always mine. So it was sanitizer, 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 over and over and over. My dear hands, rough, raw, stinging, victims of the invisible, victims of uncertainty, victims of anxiety. Next slide. But that was not enough. 20 seconds, the washing of hands, 20 seconds, a ritual of safety, 20 seconds, a way to purge the invisible from the surface of me, 20 seconds, only then could I touch my face, 20 seconds, only then could I feel safe. Next slide. We ourselves are off limits, potentially toxic to each other, carriers of the invisible, carriers of uncertainty, carriers of anxiety. It is everywhere, dread of the toxic proximity. No hugs, no kisses, no touch. Fear of breath itself, contracting. Breath itself, carrier of the invisible, carrier of uncertainty, carrier of anxiety. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but wait, a magic potion. Killer of the invisible, killer of anxiety, killer of uncertainty. But wait, is it truly a magic potion? Killer of the invisible, killer of uncertainty, killer of anxiety? Well, yes, but not completely. Is the invisible invincible? Will uncertainty ever end? Will anxiety ever end? Or will we have to resign ourselves to cautiously coexisting with the invisible, with the uncertainty, with the anxiety? Ah, next slide, please. Our next presenter is Jane Gregorius. Jane has an MFA in printmaking from California State University in Long Beach. Bachelor of Science in Education from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Jane is retired now, yay. She taught printmaking at Cabrillo for 25 years. Take it away, Jane. Hi, right, thank you, Beverly. Um, I, I, the subhead of this talk was the effects of COVID on the psyche, society, and interpersonal interactions. And I thought, ooh. The COVID pandemic made me a little crazy and I actually resented it a lot. I didn't want to make art relating to it. I felt that making something to react to the virus would be recognizing and succumbing to its power to in effect honor it. These pieces were made belatedly after I'd rearranged my sock uh, drawer several times, emptied my closet, and generally did away with lots of clutter in my house and home studio. 
uh, perhaps you can see frustration in these scribbles. Anyhow, it felt good to make these sort of angry marks, but some are controlled and orderly. Others let me, uh, led me to reference or mimic Cy Twombly, a huge favorite artist of mine who makes exquisite uh, scribbles scribbles on canvas. I mean, he used to do that. Um, the process that I'm using here is called trace monotype. And if you want to see how this exactly works, you can just Google trace monotypes and several three to five minute videos will appear. Okay, Vic, Vic why don't you keep going? Um, the idea was to make prints without using a printing press for my fellow printmakers at the tannery who couldn't or wouldn't uh, come into the studio to use the presses. The uh, technique was something they could do at home and over the weeks, over weeks, Lynn Simpson and I taught most of them individually. At one point, we could have only three people in the, the uh, tannery print studio at once and, and then finally only one person. If you remember carbon paper, this process will make some sense to you, but you use an inked plate instead of carbon paper. Putting pressure down on the back of the paper face down into any color will make, put a mark on the front of the paper. Any pressure, rubbing, thumping, scraping, scratching, dragging a fork, pencil and pen will make interesting marks and also interesting smudges. Though if this is done wrong, you can uh, completely ruin the print. I made perhaps 25 plus disasters in learning this process. Um, the paper, used of course is important. Uh, my favorite is Japanese, Japanese uh, rice, sometimes called rice paper. And how thick you roll the ink on the plate underneath is very important as well. Um, so here you have, uh, there's TM, the title of this means trace monotype number 54. I'm trying to make a whole bunch of these. And um, Vic, you can go ahead, I just put in uh, so a couple of studio pieces here. And then I'm going to show you the, um, and that's good. This one on the left is called Seven Dogs, TM, Seven Dogs. And it has to do with cutting up other prints and uh, putting them together on, on the same background. Um, Vic, go ahead. Um, so these are, the, there are two of these, these are the newest things. These are about a week old. Um, they're 48 by 11 inches uh, wide on teabag paper, which is a really nice um, translucent, but kind of textured paper. Um, so I did use black ink on this. I mean, I think I'm kind of getting a direction on this. So I cut up, then I cut up colored three inch squares of trace monotypes and then sewed them on to the piece. And um, I want to kind of continue this for a while and see, see where this leaves me because I, I got a, a good deal of satisfaction from this. I mean, I wasn't angry, I kind of was liking it. Um, I wanted to give a little quote, I think there's time, uh, from Cy Twombly, a, a real hero of mine. And he says about his line, my line is childlike, but not childish. It is very difficult to fake, to get that quality you really need to project um, yourself into a child's line. It has to be felt. Anyway, so um, we'll be taking questions, I believe, at the end, if anybody has any. Thank you, Jane. Sorry, I had myself <laughs> muted there. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Next up is Tobin Keller. Uh, Tobin teaches painting and printmaking and has been at Cabrillo for over 30 years. He was director in, uh, of the uh, Cabrillo Gallery for nearly 20 years. He has a BFA in painting and drawing from California College of the Arts and Crafts, now CCA, and an MFA in painting from Mills College. Take it away, Tobin. All right, thanks, Beverly. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm gonna be the least organized of the presenters tonight. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about inspiration and process. They kind of intertwine with me. Um, and just a disclaimer, all of this work was began pre-COVID um, and some of it was actually completed a month ago. So I'm really happy, I was really happy to share this work with you tonight. Um, I consider myself a screen painter. 
I paint with silk screens, traditionally called silk screens, they're just screen printing. Um, I use acrylic ink and I minimize the number of stencils or images that I work with. And I work by layering and repeatedly layering and layering. Um, the work begins with a very loose visual of visualization. I have an idea in my head. Um, I have ideas of stencils and I start to build the print. Um, some of these prints have taken two years. There's a little event that got involved called COVID and it's still involved, but I was able to break through and continue these prints. And so something about the process of layering, layering is very much like painting, but I like the fixed image on a screen on a, as a stencil. Um, and I like what it can do in terms of the interaction of the layering process. So, you know, a print won't evolve quickly um, because I'm actually working intuitively as well and responsively to the work. Um, if you notice the one on the, the image on the right in this case, that is a study for the image on the left. The one on the right is about 22 by 30. The one on the left is uh, 45 inches by I think 60 inches. I'm uh, trying to minimize my stencils again. You, you're really using only three different stencils and a stencil is an image that is on a screen um, and then I print using an acrylic ink. And I want to, I know Annie Pike is here, so I just want to give a great shout out to Annie Pike, um, who has lent me some of her screens and some of her films for making stencils. So, um, you know, there's a collaboration that happens, not just between individuals, but a collaboration that happens in making this work. Um, to tell you, the one on the left, I can't tell you how many times I printed it, hundreds of times. There's a physical activity involved, especially when you start working large scale. And I love that physical activity of printing and overprinting hundreds of times. Um, I do go back in and I will paint in color uh, using thin down acrylic inks or watercolor. So um, the one on the left is from the mold series and the one on the right is a study for the mold series. And again, that one, these are about three years old. So as we advance the slides, you'll see some more. The first slide you saw was started two years ago. And then we're gonna see the next slide, Magic of Victoria May. Um, this one was also started about two years ago. And I'm, this is one I'm still struggling with. This is a large print. It's 45 by 45 inches by 60 inches. Um, and again, trying to restrict myself to a minimum of stencils or marks and, and layer them. So sometimes the image that I'm visualizing doesn't appear right away. It takes a lot, a lot of living with these things um, and sort of nurturing them along, some more slowly than others. So it's a, you know, it's a constant interaction with, with the print. I have to say that during COVID, I was, um, I was hit like many of us with that, um, um, what do they call it, languishing. I certainly languished during COVID, but um, what really sparked me again was coming back to the, the printmaking studios at Cabrillo and getting very energized uh, and working with students. I did that all last year, but in very reduced, very reduced capacity. Uh, it is, you know, this fall that I'm actually working with full capacity classes, and it's really exciting. Um, we've gotten over the fear factor of being in rooms with 25 people, um, but, you know, I'm comfortable doing this, and the students, the students are certainly inspirational. So I think just coming back to school has really inspired me. This piece on the left, um, I'm calling it Fragonard's Dilemma. It was a really ugly piece two years ago. It was but ugly. I can't even tell you how bad this print was. It, it took um, many, many, many <laughs> photos. Hello? Okay. Um, it ended up being inspired. It was not directly inspired by Fragonard, the happy accidents of the swing. It ended up being inspired by Fragonard. Was that time? Oh, okay, I'll keep rambling. Um, anyway, I saw, I saw the color and I saw the, the light in a Fragonard painting and I've seen Fragonard paintings in person. They're frivolous, wonderful um, Rococo paintings. This one in particular has hidden images and you, you look deep into this. I love the story behind this one. Um, and I thought, all right, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna borrow some of the color reference and just really abstract it. Um, and make something really pretty out of these seemingly COVID-like forms. You know, I love that, that, that dilemma of beauty and tragedy. 
you know, that sort of Irish conflict of horrible beauty, you know, or, or dramatic, um, a dramatic incident of some sort clashing with the enormous beauty of nature. Uh, so I went for it. And again, you know, hundreds and hundreds of print of printing stencils to develop this image. It's a process that I love. Um, you know, again, it's a collaborative process with the paper and with the screen and with the inks and the colors. And again, they slowly evolved. I think, um, you know, a lot of the information, inspiration goes back to one of my former instructors, Jay DeFeo. Uh, Jay really, she taught me how to stick with an art uh, project or stick with a piece, to nurture it along, to not trust it until it was really, really finished. And that didn't mean just work on a piece for eight years like she did. It really meant to live with the piece and really look at it and observe it. This is a study for the Fragonard piece. Um, the original series that this came from, I was gonna, I was gonna um, title Mildew. Well, I let go of the mildew and I wanted something a little, a little more fun, a little more beautiful. I kind of needed that after being stagnant for a year and a half. Um, so I brought a little more beauty back into the work as well as, you know, um, I think frustration is very much a part of it. And that sort of antagonistic response that I see between these images that are kind of fighting with each other. So just so you know, that COVID-like image is actually a photograph. I, if Annie can correct me, um, it was a photograph of a glass ball. It's a photogram. A photogram of a glass ball. Thanks, Annie Pike. A Christmas tree ornament, actually. There you go. So that's the origination. Nothing to do with COVID, but you can call me prescient. Prescient. <laughs> All coincidence. Um, but I've had a lot of fun using that stencil many, many times. Um, I think I'm about ready to let it go. So thank you. Thank you, Annie. And thanks, everyone, for giving me this opportunity to look at my work from your point of view and to yammer on about it. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Tobin. Next up is Leslie Loudon. Uh, Leslie teaches photography and is co-chair of the photography department. She has a BFA in photography from Ohio Wesleyan University, an MA in photo media from the University of New South Wales College of Fine Arts in Sydney, Australia, and an MFA in photography from Cranbrook. She has been at Cabrillo for 14 years, I believe. Take it away, Leslie. Yeah. Thanks everyone, thanks for having me. So this was a, um, a recent image pair that a student did in one of my classes in the last week or two. And the assignment was to take, like scroll through your phone or scroll through your photos and find an image that uh, you wanted to make better in some way. And so the image on the right here is um, the, little, uh, the little girl with the dog. And then the image on the left is where the photographer got low, got close, and it looks like the little girl's like about to scribble um, on the paper or stab something or, or, or you know, do some kind of um, something there on the ground, play. And when I saw that image, I thought, this is, this is what I try to do with my work. I try to take something that's very ordinary and elevate its um, importance, try to make it um, interesting to have us kind of look at what we do in our daily lives and examine it and look at it from a different way. Um, so I, I love this piece that she made and thought it was a good introduction to what um, I'm going to share tonight. And then during COVID, um, my husband and I were at home with the kids on Zoom and a lot of chaos happened <laughs> while we were very, very busy. Um, and I typically work in a kind of a documentary style where I'm photographing things without setting them up and changing things. And so this is a scene, I, I started to see these things happening all over um, the house. And, uh, um, you know, the my, my messages from childhood of like, clean, clean up the mess, everything's a mess, you've got, you know, order and um, uh, I couldn't quite have a grasp on everything and have the control over everything um, that I felt I needed to at that time. So I made images 
uh, like this of what was happening at home. And so you can flip thanks and so this one like for instance i was you know on a zoom call and the kids are hungry and they're asking me i need a snack and they, i'm like oh, go get some popcorn i said you know nine zero start and sometimes it would turn out to be nine zero zero start and stuff with you know smoke and i get that the uh, microwave is still kind of smells so um yeah that's the kind of stuff that was going on in in my house um and i decided to kind of research the theory of messes and lucky for me, uh, not all order is good and not all messes are bad. Um, you can flip, Victoria. So once I started to see some of these things happening around, um, the first one I got the idea for was this one in the middle, which my daughter took this green food coloring and she put it in a bowl and then took like a paper towel on the top of a something else and dipped it in. And it made this like beautiful kind of watercolor spread of of um, ink on top of it there on the right. And I came out and it was like this and it was in the evening. It had been a long day on the computer. And I came out and I decided to get um, one of my LED light panels and to light it kind of make it eerie. But really, I think what I was doing is just bringing light to something to make us see the ordinary in a different way or something that bothered me to see it in a different way. And so, um, I started to see and, and you know leave these messes, so to speak, what I ended up calling good messes, change my perspective on what they were and um, get this sense of, of looking around um, at our own ordinary everyday lives and kind of those expectations that we have for the way that we live, choose to live um, and look at it in a, in a different way. And I sometimes wonder, I don't know if, if my works for an art audience or just for my, um, my community and, and what I'm going through at the time to try to answer some of these larger questions and make conscious decisions about how I want to see things. And so from um, the theory of messes, they said, you know, innovation can come from messes, uh, new senses of order, and um, uh, just, just looking at that sense of freedom and the idea of of being in a moment um, and and capturing these creations, bringing beauty to them that that um, you know we may have always been told was a mess, but it's actually like a real sense of being in the present for children, and and being creative and coming up with innovation that can be so hard to do as an adult to to be innovative and free. Um, so the one on the left there, the kids made with the bird seed and they opened the front door and they said they wanted a bird to fly in the house so that they could have a pet. Um, you know, so that was that was that one. And then this one on the right is an everything bagel container and they put their um, sucker in it to kind of hold it up as a, a, a holder for their lollipop thing there. Um, and um, yeah, so that's the inspiration for this work. I made the the tops of them after I took them um, with this LED light panel, which is like a daylight balanced light. So it's really like this crisp light. Um, and I put my camera on a tripod because it was a long exposure because it was so dark. Um, it lit these up in this eerie way. And then I would kind of extend the top and use that black in the background for sort of like mystery um, uh, to them and to bring like elevate the ordinary essentially and try to have it be less of this this personal just a personal kind of snapshot and more of a universal look at how we choose to live um, and then the one on the left was a very recent image that I did where I went to a friend's house and they have an above ground pool for the kids to play in and um, I saw this there floating in the pool and it was um, they the kids took all these water bottles and wrapped them up with duct tape to t duct tape to make a raft um, and my friend helped, got her, I was like, do you guys have an LED light? And they did. So she came out and she's holding it at night over top of the pool. And I got this image of this floating, uh, homemade floating raft. So that's my work. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. I love the Cheetos and the, uh, the tape dispenser. <laughs> Next up is Neely Drown. Uh, Neely has a BA in history. Excuse me. A BA in history with minors in film studies and political science from the University of Pittsburgh, an MA in international affairs from the University of Pittsburgh, and an AA in photography from Foothill College. 
Neely has been teaching photography at Cabrillo since 2020, January. Take it away, Neely. Thank you, Beverly. So um, this is this project was was born during COVID. And uh, so it's very much a work in progress at the moment. And uh, it stemmed really from last spring, having some great conversations with my students about what it is that they liked about the classes that, that we teach at Cabrillo. And a number of students said to me that one of the things that they really enjoy is that when they come to class, they always learn about new photographers and that we don't, that while we teach and talk about Ansel Adams and the Westons and you know, the, the, the white male canon, um, that they always come away with a whole slew of new photographers whose work they enjoy exploring and learning from. And that was a challenge to me to continue um, exploring more work. And so I spent a fair amount of time uh, during COVID uh, listening to interviews of contemporary photographers or contemporary photographers talking about uh, photographers who influenced them um, when they learned about their, their work being new to them. Maybe they hadn't learned about them when they were in school. And so I began to explore the work largely of, of women photographers, women of color, um, as well as, as, as uh, not. Um, and uh, since I live in Oakland, uh, I started with uh, women photographers who were from my immediate area and sort of reveling in the footsteps <laughs> that I get to walk in when I leave the house every day. And so Anne Brigman and Imogen Cunningham and Dorothea Lang to a point, although not so much an, an influence on this work here, I began to explore their work. And um, then I moved on to Anna Mendieta, a Cuban American photographer um, who did, uh, who passed away or perhaps was murdered, controversial um, in the 1970s. And then on to contemporary photographer, Azita Ganjai. And um, one of the things that I found quite inspiring about their work was that a lot of their work or all of their work explores women in a natural place, women who connect to nature in some way, the mythological connection of women to, to as mother earth and that um, the pressure of, of what that is to be put on women and women's bodies and the patterns of nature and how women's bodies and the patterns that we find in nature and the natural world connect. And this is all happening at the same time that all of my places where I find solace are closed off to me, museums and movie theaters and such. And I had a number of female friends who were going out hiking and doing things outdoors, which is really not me at all. And I became fascinated with the, all of my city friends who were going out and hiking and, and talking about camping and doing things that they hadn't done before. So with all of that influence, I decided to um, start a project and I wanted to explore the influences of the photographers I mentioned with um, and photograph women who live in my neighborhood. And it was a great opportunity because um, I got to meet women in my neighborhood. I, I'd never met them before. Um, and I put out a call asking for women who had found nature during this time. And these photographs are two, um, two diptychs that I've made. Um, again, it's a work in progress. I came to the diptychs a little bit late. So I have to go back and, and sort of re-photograph um, some of the women. Luckily they live in my neighborhood. Um, and the first one, Mimosa, the woman you saw earlier, she was my first. Uh, who I photographed and she swims in the San Francisco Bay uh, several days a week, all throughout the year. And I was, I, that was amazing. I was in the water with her, although not submerged. And um, I don't know, I, I began to feel like the way she was expressing how she felt being there, I began to feel that. And that was a really great um, experience for me. And then here's another woman who works, who, who lives in my neighborhood, um, Anka, she's a, um, a yoga instructor. She also has an MBA from um, Penn State, I believe. And uh, what I tried to do with her 
hers was the first diptych, but I did with her as we were out photographing. But as we were walking around, she's a single mom and she was telling me about her daughter. And I saw this sunflower on the ground and she got a little emotional because this sunflower is very much um, a flower that she and her daughter share a love of. And then it's wrapped in seaweed and she feels very connected to the ocean. So I had these two women who were connected to the ocean, but in very different ways. And um, so, yeah, I see this series continuing. I've made some more images since, although they weren't ready to show. Um, but yeah, that's the project I'm working on and I'm, I'm hoping to continue with it. So that's, that's it. That's what I've got. Thank you, Neely. Thank you. All right, next up is Claire Thorson. Claire has an MFA in pictorial arts from San Jose State University. She is the chair of the art studio program at Cabrillo, our fearless leader. She teaches introduction to art making, drawing, and co-teaches a course in creative careers at Cabrillo. She's been here since 2007. Welcome, Claire. Hi, everybody. Thanks for that introduction. So I'm going to show you a group of paintings that are from a series that I'm loosely calling internal. Um, my current work usually involves the figure, but I began as a landscape painter. That outdoor painting experience really opened the door for me uh, in terms of painting. And I feel like both the figure and the landscape are subjects that I've internalized over the years. Um, so these works are um, in between. Uh, they fall in between uh, larger, more planned projects, and they fall in between wondering and knowing. They're mostly about not knowing, um, about entertaining uncertainties. Uh, they break with the logic of form and space. And since form and space are illusory in painting, paintings can live where logic doesn't hold. Uh, these works are reworks. So they have layers and other paintings underneath. Uh, they're thick with indecision and with paint. Uh, they are landscapes and figures, but they're not observed. Uh, they rely on memory, uh, on parameters and proportions and gestures and weight that I have internalized. And I would say that this kind of painting is like dreaming. Um, artists or painters, um, they may plan work, they may build work according to a familiar sequence of actions, uh, but for periods of time, I think I speak for a lot of artists, we need to wander and wander the unknown. Uh, for me, that wandering happens in the picture plane. That is my great unknown, that picture plane space. And I like to go there and see what's possible. Um, the improbable becomes more compelling for me. Um, the break from expectations is intriguing. Most of my other work is large scale, five or six feet on one dimension. Um, much of my work is figure-based and narrative. These works are small. There isn't a dimension that's longer than 24 inches. And that way they're a little more intimate than my usual work. And they develop an internal logic that has to do with color, with stroke, with light, with uh, darkness, with scale, with degrees of representation or abstraction or other elements. Um, color and paint are emotional for me. Surface is emotional for me. It's like the weather. It's full of change and full of mood. So I love to look closely at parts of paintings. Um, feelings come up when I see paint. <laughs> so uh, composition is maybe something a little more intellectual, a little more of an intellectual pursuit. It's a way to make meaning of all of these elements. So these works are still in process. They're still in between. They may change a little or a lot before I let them rest. And um, I would just say that there's no really easy end to a painting. So 
Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Claire. I, I love your descriptions. So rich. All right. Well, thank you to all of the presenters. That was really great. Um, Vic, I know you're moving through some slides here, but we get to the next slide. Oh, more of Claire's. Okay. I must have spoken quickly. I do that. <laughs> all right. Let's get out of this slideshow and have a chat. Okay, so um, does anybody have any questions? A lot there to work with. I can start. Okay. Unless anybody else, I can break the ice. I was just curious how Neely, um, you said you found people in your neighborhood. Um, did you, and you said they were strangers. Yeah. Uh, how did you put out your call? Um, I started with, uh, there's a, I have a, there's a Facebook group, uh, um, called by it's by nothing. And I think they're, yeah. they have them for all different neighborhoods, but there's a connected group called being neighborly and some places have them as well. And it's a place where you can go to, um, ask for a dentist recommendation or, you know, moving company, you know, with th things that, that, um, to reach out to neighbors. And it's been a great resource during COVID where we're not really walking up to each other's front doors and knocking anymore. Um, and so I reached out there and then I also put out a call to the East Bay Photo Collective, uh, a, a group here in Oakland I'm involved with and um, put out a call to other photographers, which I wasn't quite sure if I would get any photographers to pose for me. And so far I haven't, but a friend of one of the photographers because she took my call and spread it. So it's just kind of start, started to spread through friends, which has been great. Um, and, you know, during COVID, it's been a really amazing thing to meet neighbors who, you know, I, there's really no other way to meet them. <laughs> so it's been a lot of fun. Wonderful. Any other questions out there? Yes, I, I have a question. All right, David. Um, this is for Leslie. Um, you said that you change camera angles. Um, to make things more interesting. How do you decide which angles? Do you go several angles, take a bunch of pictures and then pick the best ones out? Or do you have preferred, like a preferred group of angles that you've used before? Oh, sure. Thanks for that question. Um, I think the, the very first example that I shared of the student from AP6, which is Introduction to Digital Photography, um, mm -hmm. that really low, I, um, like we call it worm's eye view a lot in photography, but I used to use this old twin lens and it would be at my waist. So it'd be low. And when I got my digital now, a lot of times I'll hold it really low and take this, um, like the one of the tape dispenser that has gum in it. Like that one was held really low on the ground at the level of the, um, the subject. And it gets kind of this, it can make things that are mundane. I mean, a lot of times like um, spot news and things like that, they do extreme angles where they look from high to low or low to high or get that really low point of view on things that are just might seem ordinary and it can make it a lot more interesting. So that's one of my favorite things is to hold the camera really low. Um, I think with those, I um, kind of saw how I wanted to lit, light it from before I took it and then I took a bunch and reviewed those to see which one I thought was the most kind of interesting or compelling so yeah that's, that's kind of the way that I was thinking is just take 20 pictures and yeah a lot of times that's great way to do it for sure <laughs> I have another question for you Leslie great um oh, yeah thanks do, do you uh is there any fabrication? I was thinking about Sophie Call um, and how she like sometimes there's one little thing that she adds because some of those images seem so um, wild and I'm like, did she like put <laughs> something in there? No, I mean, I would move around them to make a, you know, some kind of composition that was, comp you know, interesting or compelling and um, use of light but really they're they're like that so yeah Arlene you're muted I am muted um so 
I suspect that you had lots of opportunities to find messes to take pictures of. Can you express what would make you decide to take a picture of a particular mess? Because they're charming. <laughs> Hmm, that's a hard one. I mean, some things like one thing still hanging in here that I just couldn't get a good photo of. She uh, she took like all these stickers and put it on a can and hung it up and it was supposed to be like a disco ball that you could dance with and I just couldn't get a good photo. So <laughs> um, I don't know, just things that are odd and um, outside of the norm when I find those because yeah, there are a lot of other messes that are my own messes. <laughs> and I don't see those as quite that interesting or creative, but the kids seem to be quite good at that. So, okay. Thank you, Marlene. You're welcome. Um, Tobin, I had a question for you. Because when I hear you speak of, of, of all of the different um, elements being added over and over and over again, especially over a long period of time. Um, I can imagine uh, sometimes there being an issue where something doesn't come out just right and then suddenly it's there on top of everything else that you've already put down after all that time. Do you well, have solutions for that or? I love issues and you know, I, I, I build issues into the work. I, 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 I you know, sometimes the prints start out really, really ugly, and that's a, that's a wonderful issue to work with. If I if my goal is to make something beautiful, and you know, my interpretation of beauty, um, I'm going to work through it. And because I'm working with a very transparent medium, um, some some color or some image may not quite work, and I want to bury it. And I can actually in this process. It's very much like it's painting. Um, you know, it's like Claire building up, building up, and sort of allowing an image to merge out or in. So, you know, the atmospheric part of it is also very important. And, it, you know, if, if I need to add white layers to push something back, I do that. It's just a wonderful process of overlaying and um, issues are important. I, you know, I always tell students, in fact, make mistakes, work with this mistake, allow the mistake. And, you know, this is printmaking and painting, allow the mistake to guide you. You know, it, it's fun. It let, it, we let go of a lot of that need um, for constant perfection, which is disastrous. Mm -hmm. Perfection is disastrous for art in, in this case. And I don't plan. I work intuitively. I respond to this little tiny image in my head. That's great. Thank you for that. And it's, it's definitely a, a lesson to learn. Um, I know we have a lot of students who really want to do things right right off the bat and there's frustration in that and um, the explaining that the, the learning process is about what I call ex it's experiments like a science scientist would do we don't fail we learn what doesn't work and we then learn what does work from that so yes yeah, so it's experimentation and work and there's a famous yeah. nun, a famous nun called it plork play plork. yes sister Carita Kent I love that. I'll try to remember that. <clears throat> so, Jane, you, you, I, I know you said something about um, mistakes being like put going too far, perhaps, or having something in that layered composition go wrong. Did you have to uh, abandon things and throw them away? You said something about that. Um, unmute yourself there. Uh, you know, in printmaking, they would say there's no such thing as throwing anything away you just keep all these things and then you use them in some other way sometime i'm not sure how i'm going to use these but i did i did save all these but um i mean they would just get like black with ink and I, it, it would just be so amazing so then i wouldn't use as much ink and then i i learned that and then i learned you know how different papers reacted to and there's this really gorgeous paper called arsh 88 that is just like velvet paper, I'm sure Tobin knows it. It's actually, it was invented for silk screening. Mm -hmm. It's real thick. It's the exact opposite of uh, Japanese papers, but that was fabulous. And uh, a big, thick, you know, heavy duty paper. Um, I just didn't know what I was doing. And I, I meant that about watching those, those trace monotype videos. 
it's like that's kind of fun you know this looks good but it just took over and over and i i got discouraged but i mean i literally had 25 just awful things <laughs> but I, the 26 there was like a kind of a breakthrough and it was like whoa and then it just kind of got they got better and better and i don't i wouldn't call these things gorgeous by any means but yeah <laughs> along well, those along those lines there's a question from diana for claire um segueing from tobin she says she completely agrees with you that there's no easy way to end a painting um but claire what advice do you give to students to make that decision to just stop a piece to stop painting a piece mm -hmm. i think it's like listening so that's the best answer i've come up with that question that comes up all the time you know that that question comes up for all of us and for many students you know when am i done when is the painting done and i i really think it's just like a kind of listening you know you get a little signal you say hmm, i wonder if the painting's done might be done maybe i'll just wait and see maybe it's done and you wait and see and maybe it is done or maybe it's not done and you go back in and try to make something more of it and maybe it works or maybe it doesn't work but uh so the closest i can come to the to an answer for that question is listening sort of like listening and um you know probably there's more than one ending for every painting you know you know, I could call it done and photograph it and send it to you, or I could work on it for another couple of years <laughs> and then photograph it again and send it to you and see what you think. You know, it it is a kind of a, a call you make. Um, but um, for someone who thinks more linearly than I do, is that you? You're a painter, right, Diana? I can't see you right now. Yeah, she's not she doesn't she doesn't have a visual up but yeah yeah she's... you're a painter you know something about this so yeah it's it means pausing and looking at the painting like tobin was saying just look at it for a while listen to it for a while um sit with it whatever phrase works for you maybe try something else but um there's no set answer that's nice, though, the idea of a conversation. I mean, alluding to a conversation and, you know, maybe the conversation has petered out at some point. Yeah. And I think sometimes you'd have to walk away and come back later. Because that's the conversation is on sale and you need to have some new inputs. So I find that's the case sometimes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, Neely, I had a question for you. Yes. So, um, uh, how how many of these um, sort of paired portraits of women are you thinking you might do? Do you want it to be a big series or? You... Yeah, I'd like it to be a series. I'm looking at it as a long term project, and mm -hmm. I have photographed uh, eight women so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, but when class prep for classes started, I stopped editing, um, and part of it for me that um, was the the editing process is I wanted to get a collection of portraits made and then get a sense of what they wanted, how they wanted to be displayed, how they wanted to be edited. Was I gonna make them black and white? Was I gonna put them side by side, the women in diptychs in some related, some way? And um, I decided to include an element of the environment that um, that they chose. So they chose the locations for the photographs. I should have mentioned that. And it came from a little questionnaire that I created. So um, it's, so it's a longer it's a longer process. So I expect to continue working on this because COVID doesn't seem to be going away anyway. So <laughs> I see a lot of a lot of um, I'm still getting responses from people, and I have a list of photographs to make. Some of the women. Um, they they are choosing locations that are a little bit further away so we're trying to schedule a way for us to to get there you know one woman is an avid skier so we're waiting for winter things like that well look you'll you'll get to have all kinds of nature adventures that you never would have had 
it is interesting. I'm, I am, I will admit, gaining some appreciation, not for camping, <laughs> but, um, but I mean, it's been great. And one of the things that has been really wonderful and um, very fulfilling for me in this is that these women who are strangers to me are putting their trust in me um, to let me make their photograph in vulnerable places, places that are important to them. But some of the women have been open to posing nude. I had... <laughs> We were in a park here in Oakland, and there was a woman who got up into a tree and took off all, all of her clothes for me. And I just thought, you know, we just met 10 minutes ago. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. It's It's been, it's, it has been, it, it was probably one of the best experiences that I've had during COVID as far as um, renewed faith in humanity. And not because they're taking off their clothes, but just the trust in in their neighbor. That's great. That was That's nice. Great. Thank you. Tobin, you had a question? Well, well, this is a question for you, Beverly. I oh. really respond to your work. I love, Thank you. You know, I, I love how you're working through um, the, the angst and the anxiety and everything that we've, you know, we've been collectively, collectively experiencing for the last year and a half. I just, your work and the, the photographic quality of the, the work, the, um, the human body, um, is just really beautiful. And I know there's a tragic beauty to it. Um, again, I love that dichotomy. Um, I guess my question is, um, are you continuing with this series or have you found an end? Well, I have to say that what happened was less of creating a series than it was of connecting some dots between the work that I had made. Nice. And I, it was kind of flabbergasting because I was trying to figure out what work to put in this show. And I was also stagnating a lot during COVID in terms of being um, creative because I felt like I had a lot of worries. Um, as sister ended up with long-term COVID and my mom was starting to have problems with dementia. So it just felt, there was just like too many worries or, or weirdness and I just didn't feel compelled to make art. So when it came for the sh time for the show, I started looking through some of the things I'd made over the last few years and I ran across that image of the two hands. Mm. And all of a sudden I'm looking at it and like, oh my God, that looks like bacteria on those hands. Mm. And that's when it came to me. It's like, oh, this is, this is really just like struck me so emotionally in terms of that experience of COVID and feeling like I, uh, these hands need to be washed. I can't do anything until my hands are washed yeah. because who knows what's on my hands. Right. And so those two images together really kind of brought that up for me. And then um, the X and the O, now both of these diptychs are done with the same type of process, which is basically manipulating photochemicals mm -hmm. um, and doing it in room light or sunlight so that they create incredible effects that you can imagine getting from darkroom paper that's black and white, it's supposed to be black and white images. So that in itself is you know, a lot of alchemy and chance and never knowing what you're gonna get. So I, that was very experimental. And um, these are some of the ones that actually came out well because a lot of them turned to muck. Um, but the, um, the diptych of uh, the X and the O, suddenly, I mean, I just did those because this was something that was, some, you know, was that you, you, you put caro syrup on the photo paper and you put it in darker chemicals back and forth. And, depending on how you do that, you get all these effects. Plus I took it, got, you know, it's in room light, so you're getting weird colors. Oh, nice. And those two, I just was so amazed at the depth and sort of weird spookiness of them. And then when I looked at those two, again, it was like, oh my God, this is like hugs and kisses. And oh my God, we are not able to do that. I, you know, I can't hug my family members and feel okay about it, you know? Um, yeah. So we, you know, without a mask or even after, you know, getting, waiting to get a, a COVID test, that kind of thing when I go visit them. So there's all that, uh, it was just all of this emotion wrapped up in those images that I already had. So then as I started putting, then this sort of poetic thing started popping into my head in terms of that. So I wrote a short little thing like that for the, um, the show. And then that expanded into what I did tonight, which was, it just organically just burst out of my head. So. So connecting the dot between these these images that I already had that all made up a story in a way that they didn't have that meaning, you know, two weeks ago to me or three weeks ago. 
and now they do. So it was really an interesting sort of um, experience to have that kind of meaning to sort of, mm -hmm. you know, develop out of um, connecting the dots along a certain theme. I appreciate, I appreciate that and that process. Well, thanks for asking about it. Are there any other questions? No, I think we're all set then. We're a little bit over time. So I think it's time for us to say good night. And I really wanna thank all of you for being here and um, joining us for this conversation. And hopefully we'll see some of you next week. And um, thanks for all of you who presented tonight as well. It was just a really great sharing of inspiration and thoughts and techniques and all of that. So thanks to everybody and have a great night. Thank you, Thank Beverly you. and Victoria. Hi, Beverly.